the pale blue dot. Hey mates, welcome back to yet another episode here of the My Mate Podcast, and I'm doing a, another blog for you. I'm, I wanted to do these sorts of things for a while, but um, I had a lot of guests packed up uh, very quickly, and that was really exciting as well. So I kind of want to do a couple of shorter ones here and there, longer ones here and there, just keep spreading content about, um, hopefully educational content about the mind, um, some anecdotal experiences like this one today, but also getting some uh, professional psychologists, you know, all different ways that we can get to know our minds. Obviously, the slogan of this podcast and actually my own counseling practice is get to know your mind, um, get to know your mind, mate, you know, because we're all mates, hopefully we're all mates. And um, so that's what I, want to, what I want to keep doing. Um, and so I'm kind of spreading this sort of stuff across all different, um, you know, um, social media platforms. And um, a couple of these blogs I thought were good to, to just explore. And today's episode is actually called Meditating with MDMA. And psychedelics are seeing a bit of a revamp. Um, there's lots of stuff going on in the US with legalization of weed legalization of mushrooms in Colorado, MDMA actually going through phase three trials now because of the positive benefits people are seeing with traumatic experiences, PTSD, um, with MDMA psycho-assisted therapy. And you know, this is just my own experience with it. And um, I really want to, I think nothing should be left unsaid. I think we should all kind of seek and discover and find our own truths with things and, and, and share that information. Because I think when you suppress information, suppress aspects of yourself, suppress things that you feel like you'd like to say, but you can't say, um, that stuff gets entrenched within the unconscious shadow when it it manifests itself into projections and resentments and things. But even on a social collective level, it's good to talk about things from all different walks of, from, you know, with people from all different walks of life. It's good to, to just put things out there that could potentially be beneficial. Um, at least when they're said, you know, we're addressing elephants in rooms and, you know, we're actually kind of where we're bridging gaps, you know, and social divides. So I don't know, that was, that was super off tangent there, but, um, I guess that's the idea behind this blog. And when I per- first wrote it and and, um, and shared it, I got mixed reviews. I had someone that, you know, was super against um, this whole idea, you know. Um, she had a psychology background and we were kind of going back and forth talking about this sort of thing, you know. And um, and that's fine. That's totally fine. We've um, hit each other up on, on, you know, on many other occasions. We've agreed on different things and disagreed on different things. And that's what I want with this podcast. I want people to disagree with me so I can learn more and learn more from you who are, who are listening into the show. Um, so that was great. And then the, the positive feedback I got was from people that have had similar experiences with meditation um, on psychedelic drugs. And they don't have to be drugs per se. They can be just in different states of consciousness, you know. Um, although coffee is a drug, um, meditating after a coffee, meditating when you sleep, meditating when you're sad, angry, and just kind of, you know, having a look and see what comes up. These are all different areas and interesting things to explore. So here we go, guys. This is meditating with MDMA. And I've started off the blog with a quote. I think when used correctly, MDMA could really help a lot of people. Maybe it could help those suffering from an existential crisis. Maybe it could help those that are struggling to find meaning in their lives. It's not that we explicitly recognize a conscious will to live, but we do have desires and incentives for the potential of self-growth. We want to be better, and when we struggle to find meaning, we stop caring about growth. The lead up. My decision to explore alternate states of consciousness through the use of a substance was no easy task. If you have been following me in any way, shape, or form, you'd know that an experience on mushrooms proved life-changing, now for the better. Back in 2011, however, I was a young kid, ruled by my ego and the demands to which were never attained. I'm still ruled by my ego. (laughs) This was not something I was aware of, and having all those walls and insecurities stripped back within eight harrowing hours led to months of clinical psychological treatment, panic attacks, and high anxiety, as well as a radical shift in the way I viewed myself and the world around me. I think having that experience in my life proved more positive than anything, especially when it came to deciding to explore different areas of my mind as an adult. I'd experienced the effects of MDMA previously at festivals and raves, etc., but these experiences were solely influenced by what the external world was throwing at me. Never in my wildest dreams had I thought about facing my internal universe with such a substance. 
What is MDMA exactly? Shit, sorry, mate. Let me pull something up from Google. Ecstasy, also known by its chemical name MDMA, is often seen as the original designer drug because of its high profile links to dance music culture in the late 80s and early 90s. Clubbers took ecstasy to feel energized, happy, to stay awake and to dance for hours. The effects take about half an hour to kick in and tend to last between three to six hours, followed by a gradual come down, according to Friendly Confidential Drug Advice 2018. People often report feeling alive, warm, and totally in tune with the people around them, as well as their environment. It's kind of like everyone and everything vibes together. The same article above continues with, quote, sounds and colors are often experienced as more intense. Short-term risks of ecstasy can include feeling anxious or getting panic attacks and developing confused episodes, paranoia, or even psychosis. I did, you know, make sure that I threw that in there, not to be super biased in one way or another. In short, MDMA is a psychedelic drug that distorts reality. What better way than to view life through a different lens? It's time for a change in perspective. I wonder why so many people travel. Why do people change jobs? On average, every three years, apparently. Why do people fall out of love? Different perspectives are humbling and important for self-growth. Life is impermanent, and that very fact is something many of us struggle with, myself included. Changes in perspective help break the cycles. It's just something to consider. I do not agree with any absolutist mentality. This holds true for a statement like, drugs are bad. I think we can all agree in this day and age that a statement like that is pretty ridiculous. The term drug is incredibly ambiguous and different drugs help and hinder different people for different reasons and circumstances. However, when undertaking a potentially transcendental experience like meditating whilst on psychedelics, I was careful to firstly consider the research and dangers. Hallucinogenics alter perspectives. They can be incredibly overwhelming and potentially life-changing for better or for worse, depending on your viewpoint. I needed to consider the reasons why I wanted to meditate on MDMA. Was my ego getting in the way? Did I want to have an experience just so I could tell everyone about it? Was I egotistically attempting to face a fear? Was I searching for something externally or was I humbly hoping for an enlightening introspective experience? I am a naturally impulsive person. Just ask my partner. She'd jump at a statement like that. Before undertaking this meditative practice, I spent a good few weeks making sure there was nothing I was trying to prove to myself or others, nothing negative or arrogant associated with this, and that my reasons were purely personal. I think it's important to consider these questions when undertaking something potentially risky. Is the juice, juice, excuse me, is the juice worth the squeeze? Why are you doing this? Are any underlying mental health issues present? It may be a good idea to resist the temptation until you feel a little more centered and clear. That said, it totally depends upon the individual and their circumstances. On the other hand, much evidence is now coming out from such organizations such as MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and John Hopkins University pertaining to the positive long-term effects associated with psychedelics. Personally speaking, I can absolutely attest to that fact. Such evidence reigns true, anecdotally speaking. What psilocybin did for me all those years ago, the unraveling of deep-seated anxiety and disconnection from self, in which I then had to work through, proved to be absolutely life-altering. So, do your research, be smart, seek advice, and take the appropriate measures, like with anything in life. Set and setting, rule number one. When meditating on MDMA, never snort it. (laughs) In fact, don't ever snort it. It sucks. It is extremely painful and takes on a different effect. The effects do not last as long and do not in any way, shape or form equate to that which is experienced through ingestion. If someone were to snort MDMA, I imagine that particular individual's intention would be to experience a quick high at a festival or something of that nature. From my research going into this, drinking MDMA, I poured it into a glass of water, MDMA is highly soluble in water, makes the experience far better and longer lasting. Rule number two. Set your intention before you take MDMA. Once the effects kick in, it is very difficult to move from one task to the next. All you want is to stay present and feel the love. You can't imagine doing anything else, but listen to the music, talk to the same person for hours, or sit with yourself. So, with the intent to meditate in the back of your mind, the motive is a little more influential. My personal recommendation would be to play some calm or relaxing music, drink a glass of wine, and mindfully recognize the state to which you are about to enter. Maybe you could get a little introspective from the outset. 
You can even practice some yoga or reconnect with your body through journaling. Rule number three, keep the setting familiar and recognize the need to let go. You are about to enter an altered state of consciousness, a different perspective, a different way of viewing your internal landscape, and that fact alone should be met with humility and gratitude. Be thankful for your experience and for the setting to which you find yourself in, not to mention the people around you if you are with company. Rule number four, recognize that the effects will pass eventually. This awareness helps with one's ability to let go and allow the thoughts, potential visuals and emotions to manifest if that is what happens. For me, it helps with rule number three. From experience, MDMA is slightly less overwhelming than magic mushrooms. It's almost as if you can tap into the effects of the drug and recognize that whilst you're doing it. Mushrooms seem to take you on a journey whether you like it or not, and they can be pretty wild. Lasting details. Since my last experience with mushrooms, there has always been a degree of apprehension prevalent within the acute lead up to taking a mind altering substance. Even though coffee is one too, this even holds true for coffee, like I just said. <laughs> it's all a spectrum. We must remember that the term drug is ambiguous and the way in which I use it here pertains to any substance that elicits an altered state of consciousness, whether that be temporary or long lasting. In that regard, I struggle to find a significant distinction between substances like coffee and MDMA, albeit one is illegal with the specific ingredients unknown to the user in the current social state. In no way, shape or form am I playing that down. The risks of taking MDMA, especially if you buy it off the street, are far greater than that of coffee. But in terms of the drug itself and of its potential benefits to depress society, maybe we'll leave that to the experts. As previously stated, some users may experience panic or anxiety as the effects of MDMA come to fruition. This common symptom is known as come up anxiety. My come up anxiety is always prevalent and in some ways augmented by the lasting effects of the mushrooms used prior. Because that trip was, at the time, personally perceived as a negative trip, my anxiety in the lead up to experiencing an altered state of consciousness will never subside, as far as I can currently tell. Although, psychedelics, what they actually do is kind of rewire those thought patterns and those behavioral patterns. So, you know, as stuff comes out with some of the um, scientific studies that these people in America and even some, some psychologists here in, in Melbourne now are doing some trials with psilocybin on, on terminally ill cancer patients, maybe they'll start to say, hey, this is all about rewiring the nervous system, rewiring the neurons in the brains and, and actually helping people see life with different perspectives, see themselves in different perspectives. So I did say as far as I can currently tell in brackets, but maybe we're gonna learn more about how we can actually change our thinking. However, I am now at peace with the fact, with that fact, and it actually guides me spiritually, letting me know when there are challenges I need to face. So this is the experience, guys. All the doors were closed, the blinds were down, and the bed covers were all laid out neatly, like a cozy cubby house on the couch. It was the perfect meditation domain. A candle flickered gently on the kitchen bench, and a half full glass of wine sat next to it, patiently waiting to be finished. I connected my computer to the TV, typed into YouTube eight hour meditation music and scrolled through to assess my options. It had been close to an hour since I'd sprinkled the MDMA into a glass of water and drank it. As I recall, I'd been feeling the effect significantly for about 15 minutes because I'd made a mental note as to how awesome the house music I was playing in the background sounded. The MDMA felt great. The music sounded great and I could feel myself swaying out of time, yet unbeknown to me, as though becoming one with the vibration of the tunes played by the DJ with lovely green velvet hair. If you know green velvet, you know who I'm talking about. It was difficult for me to change the musical elements of the setting. I wanted to dance and continue to listen to the house music. It was what I was used to. I was comfortable in this environment. The festival-esque setting brought with it a sense of friendship, good vibes, laughter, energy, and love for everyone who'd shared such experiences. It seemed to dull to meditate when all I wanted to do was call my friends and tell them how much I love them. But my intention was clear and sat stubbornly in the back of my mind, like my little anxiety man once did, guiding me through life. I chose a video with the thumbnail of a big beautiful moon. It just felt right and when experiencing the effects of MDMA, any decision made coupled with that feeling is all you need. It will make you trust your intuition tenfold down the track. I listened to the music and watched the moon intently. I watched the waves roll in and out, 
The video depicted a nightly lit beach with a big moon in the foreground. My partner, whom I was undertaking this experience with, fell into a trance almost immediately. It took me a little longer. It seemed I was content with watching the waves and the moon, feeling the warmth of the bed covers and the soft couch beneath my back. Not long after, however, I felt it was, it was time to close my eyes, put a pillow over them to augment the already bold darkness and let the MDMA take me to wherever it needed to. For a short while, nothing happened. I felt completely connected to my body. I felt comfortable, warm and satisfied. I couldn't see a thing. Then, out of nowhere, a bright white light shot into my vision and immediately vanished. It was almost like it pierced the darkness with immense and infinite power. But, as stated, before I could take it in, unpack it, or as I like to describe it, give my ego the time to try and make sense of what had happened, it evaporated from existence. I could feel my heart beginning to pound. My thoughts began to race, and a panic attack that, up until that point, lay dormant began to manifest. Again, it's just important here, guys, to... Uh, mention something, at least from the way I see it, that panic attacks, anxiety, all that sort of stuff, they are signals from the outside world or from the internal world telling you that something's up. Now, socially, we are conditioned to think that a panic attack is bad, and I definitely used to think that as well, but it is there for a reason. So if you just kind of change your perception to that, a panic attack is happening for you. It's not happening to you. It's trying to tell you something. And the way I see this, then thoughts began to race, a panic attack, all that sort of stuff. My ego, who I think I am, who you think I think I am, all that sort of stuff is being like, hey, what's going on, what, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? But you can separate yourself from that. You know that you're not your thoughts. You know that emotions, you're not your emotions. You're this, you're this product of all of these things, you know, hands, feet, toe. If you identify yourself as one specific thing, you're only ever going to be that one specific thing. Panic attacks happen for you. They're trying to tell you something. That doesn't mean that what you're doing, like in this example, is a bad thing. It's just an indication or a signal for something. Like if you get a panic attack at your job, is that job right for you? So my ego is going, oh shit, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? But the reason I undertook this experience in the first place was to question my own ego for that reason. I wanted to get a different take on who I was. And obviously there's going to be some resistance to that because it's not easy to change. And it, we, we are comforted by permanence and by knowing things, you know? So my ego's like, cool, this is what I know. And I have taken on the intention to question that. So it's going to be resistant to that. But if you have a panic attack, this is what I tell people, right? If you have a panic attack, it's not just bad and that's it, all right? It's there for a reason. And then it's up to us in the counseling practice or, or yourself just through reflection to think about what it's trying to tell you. You know, our evolution through hundreds of thousands of years has evolved to keep us safe. And we are much more trusting, open-minded, open to love when we do feel safe. But sometimes the ways in which we've created our safe little homes aren't actually congruent with how we could be even happier and find more meaning and more purpose. I know this is a big tangent and it's important for me to say. So it's always good to, the way I see it, analogous to staying in your house of comfort and that's where you can open up and be vulnerable with the people you love, but stepping outside of that house every now and then just to take an objective audit on and be like, right, Am I living my best life here? And this is what these sorts of psychedelic substances can do. But even on a very, very small level, taking a different route home from work, questioning your habits, all these sorts of things, being honest with yourself are ways that you can grow. And to grow, you have to be uncomfortable. And that is how we do it. That's how we've done it across hundreds of thousands of years. We wouldn't have got to this stage with webcams and microphones and internet without pushing the boundaries of ourselves and as a species and a human race. So that's why I just I just felt it really necessary to say when you when you hear a phrase like panic attack, you're like, oh shit, panic attack, it's real bad. Wrong. It's just there for a reason and it's important for us to unpack that. Okay. So panic attack. This was a big one. I was freaking out. <laughs> Upon reflection, I recognized that because my ego was unable to process what had just happened. 
it began to fear the uncertainty of what may happen next. However, as the panic arose, so too did this sensation of the panic being ripped away from my authentic sense of self, as though my ego was being peeled off like a burnt top layer of skin after a day in the sun. This sensation continued to manifest, and it wasn't long before two representations of me, or selves, stood facing one another from either side of my vision. I know this is going to sound a bit trippy, guys, so just stay with me on this one. Excuse me. So... In a sense, one part of me lay on the couch watching all this happen. Another part of me dislodged itself from me and moved to the left. And the third self lay quivering and fearful to the right. So these were in my fields of vision as as my eyes were shut. I was simultaneously experiencing two out-of-body alternate states of consciousness. What's more, the two exterior selves felt familiar. It was as though I'd recognized their existence as separate states of consciousness from a past memory. To an extent, I felt I'd entered the doors to my very own reunion party, familiarizing myself with two separate and old me's. The panic-stricken self moved further away to the right and took on the form of a younger self, a scared self. This was a self protected by walls against high school bullies, fears about sexuality, the afterlife, ghosts residing in the house I grew up in, intimidatingly beautiful girls and monsters under the bed. Simultaneously, and to the left of my vision, an overwhelming entity of love grew. I knew what this state of consciousness was. It was not an entity, but rather the manifestation of my highest self, represented by the love I am capable of receiving and giving to the universe, all matter contained. The MDMA had seemingly compartmentalized different aspects of my character and externalized them for me to reflect upon. I was in complete awe. Here I was, lying on a couch in complete darkness, watching as my ego, shrouded in fear, faced up to my highest self, painted with love, care, and gratitude. Up until this experience, I thought that the manifestation of different aspects of the self were mutually exclusive. The MDMA showed me that all different aspects of my character, volatile as it may be and subject to change, lie within me, contained in my subconscious, yet exist simultaneously. So, we are like I said before, a product of all things, good and bad, okay? We're not just good, we're not just bad, we're not just our past, we're not just our future, we're not just the things we do, the things we say, the people we hang around with, that all lies in us. And if you listen to the podcast that I did a couple of weeks back with Adam Smerling, who's a psychoanalyst, he said that we're inhabited by all these different desires of others, and then we kind of look to attaching ourselves to them. So it's important to recognize that we you can, you can almost fragment yourself. And you just think about that uh, in layman's terms. Are you the same person you are with your spouse as compared with the person you are when you're hanging with your parents? You know, think about it like that. The MDMA showed me that all different aspects of my character, volatile as it may be and subject to change, lie within me, contained in my subconscious, yet exist simultaneously. My loving self grew to new heights and encompassed a major portion of my vision by this time. To my frightened self, it seemed intimidating. However, its energy was by no means negative or bullying. Its goal was to help my younger, frightened self come to terms with the past, reconcile its demons, and break down the walls that prevented it from growing into an adult. The adult, if I may call myself that, that is currently writing these words or reading this to you. This was another major takeaway from the experience. Up until this point, I had no idea as to the degree we hold on to trauma. Trauma manifests itself in many different ways, whether that be through physical tension, rounding one's shoulders over in a hunch to protect one's heart, emotional distress, distress, and triggers or egotistical reactions to otherwise innocuous occurrences. For me, it seemed my trauma of the past lay within the confines of my own mind, a younger, frightened self with walls and fears of the unknown. Before long, my loving state of consciousness, consciousness moved towards my younger, scared self. I could see the panic begin to take hold of him. Then a voice began to speak between the, stu- between the two states of consciousness within the infinite darkness of my mind. This is what it said. Mate, I love you so much. Thank you so much for protecting us. Thank you so much. I love you. You don't need to be afraid any longer. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. My frightened self responded. But I'm scared. What happens when we die? You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. I'm scared. Then out of nowhere, my younger self dissipated and a 
and the projection of visuals exploded from where he stood. So I was, my eyes were shut, right? And then it was just like to the left was this ball of entity and my right side was this younger scared self. All my fears came bursting out of his chest, the younger scared self, like a screen projector, one by one. I immediately recognized my old fear of hell, depicted by a foggy, brown, all-encompassing mist rolling towards me, the me that lay on the couch. I saw hellish, demonic figures dancing and laughing menacingly, and creative representations of bullies and other entities pertaining to my fears of mental health disorders like schizophrenia. And yet, just as each fear began to grow and move towards me, the loving entity wrapped itself around them into what I can only now describe as a hug, more powerful and warm than any I'd experienced or seen in the movies. It would talk to the fears like mother to child. Quote, this is what it said. It's okay, there's no need for you anymore. Thank you so much for protecting us, but we can take it from here. We're safe now. One by one, the fears would grow, mold, and then dissipate with each successive hug of warmth from this energy of love, this state of consciousness I was not aware of until this time. Then I felt a sharp prod. Tom? My partner kicked me in the shins. It wasn't very hard, but it was hard enough to snap me out of whatever I was experiencing. I sat up. I could hear her phone alarm ringing. She'd set it for 30 minutes, and it felt like two minutes had passed. It was mind-boggling. My jaw dropped, and I looked at her. How'd you go? It took a while for her to respond, seemingly struggling to find the right words to express her own experience. After a short while, she mumbled five words I'll never forget. I spoke to my grandma. So now I'm just going to go into a little brief reflection on, um, on this blog. Writing this blog and reflecting upon this experience has been very eye-opening. It's taken me a good few weeks to break down and comprehend the experience itself. From a logical perspective, the MDMA made me feel great and spending time with myself, feeling great, produced a positive outcome. However, I choose to recognize the experience as spiritually significant because it feels right to me. I think the MDMA did split different aspects of my consciousness. I think its intention was to outline and compare them. It taught me that I am capable of loving people and myself so much more than I do. It taught me that it is people, excuse me, it taught me that it is possible to recognize the past, to move on and to accept it. Ultimately, it comes down to choice. We can choose to live in scarcity and fear in the assumption, in the assumption that the world is a frightening place and that good things happen only to those who take, steal and live through their ego without any awareness as to the other aspects of self. Or we can choose to give and to share and love without any expectation or desire. I learnt that to be happy, one must be grateful. I learnt that to be happy, one must give. I consider myself a happy man, and yet I have never felt happiness like I did when connecting with that entity of love or my higher self. I think this is the beauty behind MBMA, all risks considered, and I truly do mean that. It shows you a comparison to yourself. It shows you how you live and compares that to how you could live. We can all be happier. Not that happiness is necessarily the goal, but I think it is. Happiness brings about a sense of drive to which we may find more meaning in our lives. Meaning is the key, after all. A perspective shift like this can be utterly life-changing. As for me, I don't consider my experience life-changing, albeit confirming a few things I was, to some degree, already aware of. And the blog finishes with the uh, first quote, which again, I'll, I'll say here, guys. I think when used correctly, MDMA could really help a lot of people. Maybe it could help those suffering from an ex existential crisis. Maybe it could help those that are struggling to find meaning in their lives. It's not that we explicitly recognize a conscious will to live, but we do have desires and incentives for the potential of self-growth. And I think it's up to us to find those for ourselves. We want to be better and when we struggle to find meaning, we stop caring about growth. So it is down to what you're going to do that makes life worth worthwhile for you. And, you know, that MDMA experience just showed, showed me a few things. And I really don't want this to be a, you know, oh yeah, psychedelics, here we go. Because I, I don't agree with that. I think there's lots of risks to consider, you know, um, absolutely. But I think there's also a lot of potential benefits for it as well. And a lot, a lot of the research continues to suggest that. So guys, that was my MDMA experience, my meditation on MDMA experience blog. Uh, I really do want you to reach out to me to, to maybe talk, tell me about your own experiences. Um, tell me if you disagree and why. 
Uh, tell me if you agree and why. Um, you know, a lot of this podcasting is all about trying to find better ways to get to know ourselves. And that was a way that helped me get to know myself a little bit more. So um, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, and just finally, guys, Mind Mate Counseling. I, uh, it is now officially a thing, which I'm very humbled and excited about, operating out of the Breathwork Shed uh, here in Melbourne, which is my partner Siobhan's uh, business, meditation business, which is all about releasing trauma as well. So if you or you know someone who feels like they'd like to have a chat, about anything in life, counseling, that sort of thing. Um, don't feel afraid to give them my details. Guys, I love you all, and I'll speak to you shortly. Bye.